Welcome, everybody. I'm David Ezer, Vice President of Programs with Jewish Funders Network. Delighted to have you with us. And some of you, I think, probably may be new to JFN. I wanted to just take a quick second at the beginning of, of, this, pro of this program to say, uh, you know, this is one of many, many programs that we've been doing over the summer, uh, looking at different sectors and how COVID has affected them, that different sectors of interest to the Jewish philanthropy field. Uh, we have a range of programs coming up, which you, of course, can see on our website and many other elements uh, about the value of being a, of being a, uh, a member. And we hope you may be inclined to, um, to, to visit and check us out a little bit more, uh, including, of course, an annual conference, which we hope will be able to be a live event next year. But this is still uh, TBD, as, of course, are most things uh, Given, given the situation. So uh, with that said, I'm happy to just quickly introduce the panel today and then, or just let you know who's here and some quick business and then we'll hand it to, uh, to off to begin. So with us today are Georgette Bennett, uh, former JFN chair and the end of the Polanski Foundation. Our other speakers this, eve this afternoon or morning, where you are, are George Sellum, Senior Vice President of Programs with the Anti-Defamation League. Natalia Mahmoud, the Assistant Director for U.S. Muslim Jewish Relations of the AJC, and Cheryl Oletsky, the Co-Founder and Exec Director of Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. Uh, just so everybody knows as well, Cheryl has a little bit of a personal health issue going on in her house and may need to jump off the call briefly if it happens, just so you aren't surprised by her disappearance. And with that said, I'm happy, Georgette, to turn this to you and, and we can get the program started. Thank you, David. Well, as you're all probably aware, acts of hate targeting Muslims and Jews have been mounting at an alarming rate in North America and Europe. Anti-Semitic incidents hit an all-time high in 2019, and hate incidents overall have spiked. The COVID-19 pandemic is fueling both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia with wild conspiracy theories. There's an elaborate propaganda campaign that claims that Israel is deliberately promoting COVID-19 in the occupied territories. Another theory claims that Israel created COVID-19 in order to take credit for developing a vaccine. In an Oxford University survey, nearly 20% agreed that either Jews or Muslims were responsible for spreading the virus, and one-fifth endorsed to some degree the idea that Jews have created the virus to collapse the economy for financial gain. Nearly 20% also agreed to some extent that Muslims are spreading the virus as an attack on Western values. Then you have far-right groups in Britain that are spreading fake news using backdated footage showing that mosques are still open during lockdowns and causing the spread of coronavirus. And one hears comments like Muslims are praying in groups and then driving taxis afterwards. Or all over the world, these ignorant religious idiots are responsible for spreading this further. History tells us that pandemics with mysterious origins trigger waves of hate along with waves of disease. In the 14th century, the Black Death was blamed on Jews and pogroms were unleashed against them. This kind of hate speech dehumanizes both Jews and Muslims and once dehumanized, it's a very short leap from verbal violence to physical violence. Now, conspiracy theories are one reason that Muslims and Jews need to make common cause. Xenophobic far-right governments and groups whose agenda is to keep their nations white and Christian are another. Immigration is an issue that unites Muslims and Jews. And while Israel is an issue that has historically divided us, all over the Arab world, there's a move to normalize relations with Israel. And this creates new opportunities for Muslims and Jews to work together to arrive at a just solution for Palestinians. But the glue that binds us is the similarities in our religions. Judaism and Islam have much more in common with each other than they do with Christianity. In fact, the earliest days of Islam Muslims observed Yom Kippur as their fasting time. 
While Muslims in Europe tend to be segregated and disadvantaged, they fare very differently in the US. Muslims, like Jews, are well integrated, eager to adopt American values, and tilt toward progressive causes. They tend to be more highly educated, more affluent, and more of them work in high-skilled occupations than the norm. On a political level, Muslims and Jews are about equal as a percent of the population. And while Jewish communal organizations have a long history in the US, Muslim civil society is becoming increasingly organized and more Muslims are attaining elected office. When Muslims and Jews make common cause, they're a powerful force for countering hate and advancing their joint agenda. Today, we're going to explore how Muslims and Jews are supporting one another at the grassroots level and how this can be modeled elsewhere in the world. And as David mentioned, we're joined by an expert panel today, but I just want to give you a little bit more information about their affiliations. Um, Natalia, who joins us from the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, um, that's actually a joint project of the Islamic Society of North America and the American Jewish Committee. And Cheryl, who is the founder of Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, that sisterhood is made up of thousands of women who come together to stand up for one another and engage in social action. And George, well, that's ADL, and I don't think I have to tell you anything more about ADL. But to compensate George, I'd like to start with you. ADL does ongoing research on hate crimes and attitudes toward Muslims and Jews. Would you take a couple of minutes to fill us in on ADL's latest findings? Excellent. Thank you, Georgette. And, and I'm really pleased to be here with you all today, uh, hosted by JFN and along with my illustrious group of co-panelists here. Georgette, you, you um, mentioned a number of really important statistics uh, in your opening remarks, and I wanted to unpack a few of those. So here's a shot at, at underscoring a few key data points. Overall, anti-Semitism and hate are being mainstreamed, and we've seen this again and again. And that impacts both Muslim communities and Jewish communities, not just in the U.S., but across the globe. The COVID epidemic and related factors have really exacerbated this trend, as the scapegoating of both Muslims and Jews have been met with much more urgency. Let me unpack some of the statistics here. Um, and specifically, I'm referring to the annual audit of anti-Semitism incidents for a starting point that's relevant to this conversation. As many of you know, since 1979, we've conducted an annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents while compiling this information from law enforcement, community leaders, et cetera. In 2019, we calculated that there were over 2,000 anti-Semitic incidents throughout the U.S. And this was a 12% increase from the approximately 1,800 record level of incidents that took place in 2018. Of these more than 2,000 incidents recorded in 2019, uh, more than 1,100 were harassment, more than 6%, uh, a more than 6% increase over the previous year. Increases across the board in the categories of vandalism, assault, et cetera, really project some very troubling trends within the category of anti-Semitic incidents. Looking at this from a different perspective, the, as the coronavirus continues to spread, we continue to see an increase in anti-Muslim ideologies that are being propagated um, and really being fueled by a range of conspiracy theories that are attempting to stoke fear, claiming Muslims are defying social distancing, Georgette, as you mentioned, and other type of conspiracy theories. One of the issues that ADL has spoken out about um, is some of the anti-Muslim stereotypes that have come out of the uh, have come out of different groups based in India, um, where in the international group Tablighi Jamaat has held a meeting uh, just as the virus started to spread in, in late February, early March, and the group was deemed by many uh, Hindu and non-Muslim groups across India as a super spreader. This led to a significant increase in both hate crime and bias-based activity towards Muslim minority groups both in India and other parts of the globe. And last but not least, every year ADL works very closely with the FBI and the Justice Department 
to look at hate crimes as they're aggregated across the board for a range of racial, ethnic, religious minority groups. What we've seen in total over the course of the past three years is a consistent increase in hate crimes and bias-based crimes that target Jews, that target Muslims, increases in attacks on homophobia, um, increases in attacks and bias-based crimes against the LGBTQ community. And within all of those statistics, we can kind of break down hate crimes and bias-based crimes that target Jews, that target Muslims, that target Asians. And so overall, I think the message here is that as we look at these incidents of hate and bias, both online and offline in the past three years, we see a consistent number of increases. And so whether it's any of the co-panelists here or the respective institutions that are dialing into this presentation, I believe it's incumbent on all leaders and all organizations to really stand up and speak out forcefully on these incidents and work to seed programmatic work at the very local level to help get ahead of where some of the, these ideologies drive hate and bias. So, Georgette, I'll stop there and then jump in in the rest of the conversation. Good, because there'll be plenty of conversation. But right now, Natalia, um, MJAC has been deeply engaged in responding to the kinds of incidents that ADL uh, has been tracking and also in improving the image of Jews and Muslims. So tell us how MJAC does what it does. Thank you, Georgette, and um, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. I just want to say, you know, um, this is a great opportunity and I'm happy to speak about the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council's work. As Georgette mentioned in the introduction, the, the council is a coalition, uh, is a project between the American Jewish Committee and the Islamic Society of North America. And both institutions have had, uh, have a history of doing interfaith work, of working with not just the Jewish community, but, but other religious communities in the United States to build a better understanding uh, and work, you know, have a better understanding uh, between the different faith groups. And a lot of that work was spearheaded by Georgette's late husband, uh, Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum, who is, um, was the predecessor of my current um, supervisor at AJC. So I'd be remiss to not mention um, the, the path that he's laid forward for us. So in that vein, you know, the AJC in particular, because that's where the staffing is for the council, has, had, has a history of doing this work and, and we can go into more details there. But around 2015, when the election, you know, the 2016 election season was, um, was taking place, we saw how the Jewish community and the Muslim community was being weaponized in the political rhetoric. And there were these policy proposals that eventually took place with banning of, um, you know, having a Muslim travel ban and the sort. And that's where AJC and some of the lay leaders, along with ISNA, decided that it was, no, it was incumbent on Americans to come together and to advocate on issues of common concern that impact both the Muslims and Jews in America and to raise a public uh, voice and, and to stand up against this. And that's where the coalition was formed. It came together before the results of the 2016 election were announced. And the issue that they decided to work on together, because there was a range of issues that the, that the council could tackle, you know, immigration, as you mentioned, Georgette, in your opening, is one thing that, that binds us. But hate crime statistics that George alluded to are, is, is one thing that, you know, impacts both communities equally. And we, we've seen um, the FBI statistics, the ones that ADL issues every year, that show that there's a rise and we need to do something about it. So with that issue, and, and we've got a coalition of prominent American politicians, business leaders, um, comedians, people who represent the different walks of life where American Muslims and Jews are, who've come together and they decided that we wanna work on an issue that we're able to show results, not just to the rest of uh, America, but to also our communities because there are so many differences um, and just so many, you know, what's taking place in the Middle East that, that really drives a wedge between the two communities. So we want to make sure that whatever issue we take on, we're able to show results. So we're pragmatic in that approach. And we've, we're led by two business leaders, Stan Bergman, who's the CEO of Henry Schein, 
Baru Katwari, who's the CEO of Eaton Allen. Um, and they want to make sure that whatever they lend their voices to um, has an impact. And hate crimes is that issue. And we've worked on legislation, advocacy arena. So we've um, advocated together in Congress on better um, federal oversight in how um, the federal government responds to issues of hate crimes and threats against religious communities. Uh, the, the first legislation that we took on was the protecting religiously affiliated institutions. And this was introduced right around the time when the JCCs were receiving those bomb threats that were being dialed in. I don't know if everyone remembers, uh, it seems like a lifetime ago, but that is where we saw a gap in where the federal government could respond to the, the, the threats that were taking place. And what the legislation does, you know, I'll speak very basically, was it ups the penalty to anyone who, um, before, if anyone dialed in and um, made a threat against their religious institutions like a JCC or an Islamic center, the, the penalty was a misdemeanor. And right now, uh, as a result of this act, it's now up to a felony, uh, up to three years in, in federal uh, prison time. So that's the issue. You know, the, the way that we've come together, we want to make sure we tackle bipartisan issues. Um, and that's the, the hardest thing. You know, it's not bringing the Muslims and Jews together. It's bringing Republicans and Democrats together um, and make sure that we're able to make change. So that's on the, the national level. And we've got a coalition of 46 leaders. I'm happy to say, you know, Georgia, Cheryl, you're two members of, of the coalition. And we've expanded that to 11 cities around the US um, to copy what's taking place on the national level and have an impact on uh, city and state policies. So we're, it's not just a top-down approach, but a bottom-up approach, but the way that we're doing, bringing that uh, change is through advocacy. Thank you, Natalia. So Cheryl, while MJAC operates more at the political level, uh, the Sisterhood is kind of a classic grassroots organization. So tell us how the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom operates. Sure. Um, the Sisterhood started out as a very small organization the end of 2014, and we are now a movement, which um, I'll address in, in a minute. I just wanted to thank you to JFN, to my esteemed panelists, for the opportunity to really raise um, awareness of the threats that are out there and what we could do together to change that curve. The Sisterhood was started with the premise that ignorance is one of the um, causes of hatred. And it's based on the contact theory. Our theory of change is based on the contact theory, which basically means it's real easy to hate someone you don't know. When you know them, it's harder. And when you, when you, it's easy to hate someone you don't know. When you know them, it's not as easy to hate them. And when you care about them, and I'll take it to the extreme, when you really care about them and love them, it's almost impossible. So the mission of the sisterhood is to bring together as many Muslim and Jewish women and teenage girls in North America, we've just expanded to Europe, to ensure that they really, really care about each other. And we know once that happens, negative attitudes, prejudice, hate disappears, we know from research that's been conducted on the sisterhood by academicians that each woman who's involved in the sisterhood and each team tells on average 23 others about the importance of speaking out against hate, the importance of interfaith engagement, and the importance of Muslims and Jews coming together. So we are now up to 8,000 members in Spring of 16, we started before the change in the administration, but in the end of 14. In spring of 16, we had 25 chapters. At the time of election, we had 50. We now have 170 chapters, 35 or to 400 to 4,000 women in chapters, 8,000 altogether. And we bring the women together with a structure, with resources, with tools, so that they could build respect, trust, and relationships. And here's the most important point. Because of those relationships, 
these women are committed to having each other's backs, to not only protecting each other, but protecting each other's communities, and to speaking out against hate toward everyone. Um, just real, very briefly, I mentioned structure. There's four main areas of focus. One is based on chapters. Chapters that have 12 to 14 women or teenage girls equally balanced that meet every four to six weeks. We have as frequently as weekly, and this is open to anyone. So if you come to our website, which I'll tell you at the end, I invite all of you to participate. As frequently as, as weekly webinars, um, Zoom meetings where we bring in leading educators, we break into groups and we all brainstorm together. What can we do to make change? We convene an annual uh, Building Bridges trip. The only time Muslim and Jewish women and teenage girls have gone to Auschwitz together. The only time Muslim and Jewish teens and girls have gone to the American South on a civil rights journey. The only time Muslim and Jewish women and teenage girls have gone to the US-Mexican border to learn more about the horrific situation facing migrants and asylees and what we could do at home. And given COVID, we are doing a virtual trip to the civil rights again, given everything that's surrounding us right now. Um, and then finally, we have our annual gathering where this year will be virtual and we're expecting up to a thousand Muslim and Jewish women, teens, and men also to come together to learn from the leaders in interfaith engagement, as well as the leaders in how you respond to hate. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, so now I'm going to invite chaos because I'm going to throw this open to the three of you, uh, Cheryl, Natalia, George. What are the challenges that you've encountered in Jews and Muslims working together? And, and how have you overcome those challenges? It can't always have been easy. Cheryl, you look like you're champing at the bit. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, 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 first of all, we're a self-selecting group. So the women that come in are all coming in because <clears throat> they want change and they want to fight hate. But there's one challenge that is always, always there. Um, I know MJAC has faced it, and it has to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and, and, and that's always looming in the background. And the way we have dealt with it, quite honestly, is to tell our members that they have to agree they will not enter into dialogue about the situation until they've been meeting for at least a year and a half, where at that point, we will help them to determine if the woman can listen with their heart instead of their ears. Once we believe that's the case, they all go through training and a curriculum. We work with the Center for Nonviolent Communication. We work with Combatants for Peace. We work with the Jerusalem Youth Qu Chorus to give our members as much of an opportunity to enter into dialogue that will have a positive outcome and allow them to learn more about themselves and each other. They don't have to agree. But that, that is the challenge that is always out there and we work very closely to make sure it's a productive challenge that turns into positive. <laughs> you must all be geniuses. Um, <laughs> uh, Georgette, if I may, I, yes, yeah, I want to. I, I want to. I want to take that question in a little bit of a different context, where, you know, in the past three years that I've been at ADL and I've worked very closely with many Jewish communal organizations <clears throat> across across the U.S. and across the globe. The majority of Jewish communal organizations are, are led and staffed by Jews. And the majority of Muslim or Arab communal organizations across the U.S. and across the globe are run and staffed by either Arabs or Muslims. And there's nothing wrong with that. But at some point, Jewish communal organizations, if they're really going to invest in this work, need to have their staff and their leadership represent that. And vice versa. And, you know, prior to joining ADL, you know, I had two decades worth of, of government experience working with Arab, Muslim, Sikh, and South Asian organizations. And those organizations, too, need to start to transform their physical look and appearance and their internal kind of backroom staffing to make sure that 
the work that they attempt to implement on a day-to-day, -day, which is good and virtuous and just work, but their own organizations are also going through a bit of a transformation. And I think as we think through the next period of racial justice and diversity and equity and inclusion, I think it's important that we all look at the, our own organizations, whether they be Jewish communal or Muslim communal or Arab or civil rights, to ensure that we're approaching the work that we do externally from an inclusive way internally. So AJC's got Natalia, <clears throat> excuse me. So Natalia, what's it like being a Muslim in a Jewish organization? I was gonna say I represent 1.8 billion people every day. <laughs> and there's no a lot of <laughs> yeah. we're, we're well outnumbered, go yes. ahead. Yeah. <laughs> but I was going to say, I mean, taking on exactly what George just said, and prior to that, Cheryl, you know, there, there is something, you know, the success of MJAC has been because it's a partnership between well-established um, organizations like ISNA and AJC, and that comes with its own benefits, you know, the staffing resources, the, the reason we're able to expand to different cities around uh, the U.S. is because we're relying on the the regional staff at AJC to help advance the work. You know, I ha I'm, I'm a part of a two-person uh, team. My, uh, I work with Dr. Ari Gordon, who is the director of Muslim Jewish programming at AJC, but, but we rely on AJC staffers to help, um, you know, work on the advocacy issues that we've laid out on the federal level and on the regional level. So that is a, a very positive thing that we have at AJC, but it also has its packages, and, and Cheryl alluded to that, you know, statements that AJC is what it is. It's, you know, it's not shy about it. And none of the members who who signed on to MCHAC, um, none of them are, are in the dark about the advocacy work that AJC does. So some of those statements that it issues that are um, not what the, the Muslim community wants at times, but I think it's a learning process. You know, um, AJC has learned that it's got a new constituency. It's, this is not just a side project of Muslims and Jews coming together and recount the achievements and the accomplishments, but things that it's doing on the other side, it does have an impact on the coalition. And I've seen the change, you know, George, um, you work in the government, I worked in the government prior to this as well. In the two and a half years that I've been uh, working on MJAC, I've seen a change in AJC's um, attitude, not that it's shifting away from its policies, but its understanding on how to engage with the Muslim community in particular. And the same goes for ISNA or the other Muslim organizations. You know, there's no counter, uh, a one-to-one -one counter to AJC, but there are a number of new and emerging organizations in the Muslim community. And so I'll add one more challenge that we face is because AGC is so established, it's over 100 years old, it's, done. it's, it's got a rich history, um, it's got statements that it's issued in the past that it's um, learning and evolving from. But on the Muslim side, you know, we're working with not just ISNA, but there are a number of new emerging Muslim organizations and keeping track of that and, and making sure that we have the best um, representation from the, very, the different Muslim communities. It's not just a one-stop shop. And that's, that's a different challenge that I would like to add to something that Cheryl already mentioned, in addition to George. Thank you. Yeah. So um, now moving from the challenges to the constructive stuff, what are some of the key areas around which you've been able to make common cause? And uh, be before anybody jumps in, I just want to, uh, tell all of our participants that um, I'll be opening this up for questions from all of you at 12.15, so please feel free to start sending your questions either through the chat or through the Q&A. Okay, um, so areas around which you've been able to make common cause and uh, some of the techniques and best practices that, uh, that you can share about that. Uh, and let's keep in mind that we've got somebody with us from Jerusalem as well. So perhaps uh, you have some thoughts about how this can be implemented in Israel. Um, I'll jump in and start. 
the common cause for the thousands of women and teens in the sisterhood is one thing, and that is responding to hate. Now you're talking about grandmas, mamas, aunts, nieces, daughters, um, granddaughters. No one messes with our kids. You're, you're messing with a Jewish mom or a Muslim mom or grandma or daughter and, and you're threatening someone's mom, doesn't, doesn't go. Um, and, and that is the common cause, coming together with the understanding that we are so much powerful as we're together. Georgette, you talked about the almost equal numbers. Can you imagine what we could do if every Muslim and Jew in North America, let's just say the United States, came together to say, we're not putting up with this anymore. Love is stronger than hate. We know that ignorance is driving this. Come with us, come break bread together. The whole um, focus of the sisterhood is sharing our stories and listening to each other and learning about each other. And once you do that, you realize we share so much more in common than separates us. We have the same goals. We want a better world for our kids. And so it's all about listening more than talking, learning, asking lots of questions, and then a commitment that we're going to protect each other and each other's communities. Okay. I was going to say, you know, adding on to what Cheryl just said regarding hate, you know, our advocacy issues, hate crimes, and we've had success um, in the first year that MJAC started where we were able, we were the only institution that were asked that was actually advocating for that legislation and we we had success so and, and the second you know right now what we're advocating for is um, just better data from the FBI regarding hate crimes and there's a legislation that uh, I'll, I'll mention towards the end it's called the no hate act or the Jabara higher no hate act that's in the senate but that's that's the common ground ground that we have and it's the advocacy issue because you know there's so many institutions like the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom and other organizations that are um, having different um, aspects of dialogue or interfaith work with Muslims and Jews. But the other thing I wanted to add is through this advocacy I've seen a de deepening of relationships between the members and that has changed how we've um, approached the council's work. One thing is, um, you know, when members of Congress about two years, a year ago, were make, had made these statements that were, um, you know, anti-Semitic or there was a, an outcry from the Jewish community, what uh, members of MJAC and like uh, Cheryl said, the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom, you know, they're self-selected, they're, they're in it for the mission of, of the group. So they are all, you know, they want to stand up with the Muslims and Jews against Islam, uh, Islamophobic statements and anti-Semitic statements. But it was through the incident that took place in Congress that they wanted to understand what in particular about what's, why is, um, hypnotized or dual loyalty, why is that anti-Semitic? Because we, you know, as a Muslim, if, if a Jewish person tells me that's anti-Semitic, I'll believe them, but I want to understand that. And, and someone who was housed at AJC, um, you know, I, it took me a few days to be able to understand why uh, something like dual loyalty was considered anti-Semitic, because as an immigrant myself, you know, that's a charge that I've also heard. Um, but so, through, we realized that we need to open up the space to allow that conversation to take place at the MJAC table. So we had, you know, we're, we're fortunate we've got uh, someone like Deborah Lipstadt, who is an expert on explaining anti-Semitism and, and has fought, um, you know, Holocaust deniers um, in court. So she was able to explain that to our Muslim participants. And, and it was also eye-opening for the Jewish participants to understand that it's not a given that everyone understands the tropes and the code words that is um, often used against their own community. And the same thing we had someone uh, talk about Islamophobia, you know, the, the tropes and triggers against each other's communities are very different. Um, the Muslim community faces it more on the national security level, you know, they're almost, um, we're almost viewed as a national security threat, whereas the tropes against the Jewish community are very different. But I've seen that change take place 
in addition to the success we've had on the advocacy level where we've been able to have meetings with mayors and um, elected officials to highlight the issue of hate crimes or how the religious land use laws are used against uh, the Muslim community for establishing a mosque, say for, you know, that's taking place in New Jersey uh, or uh, not allowing the Orthodox community to buy property. So those are some of the issues that our councils are working on, but on a, on a more uh, deeper level, I've seen that engagement take place as a result of having these advocacy meetings and discussions. And, and, and Georgette, if I may, I, I, I totally concur with my colleagues uh, in their comments. And I just wanna add an additional dimension to the, from the global vision to the important relationships uh, that Natalia described that are being built and forged but there's a really important local element here that, that's very important too. And that's where, you know, organizations like the three of ours, as well as many others, you know, do work in cities across the country and not just on the East Coast, not just on the West Coast, but everywhere in between in middle America and places like Ohio and Michigan, where I grew up and kind of, and, and every place between New York and LA, where communities are coming together to do work to, to take down the misperceptions um, of one another. And one just concrete example is something a couple years ago that ADL helped do with a, with a local JCRC in Minneapolis where we created a micro-grant program with the Somali community in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota uh, to do work to really spawn not a national organization coming in and imposing kind of a program, but, but really seeding local work within the Muslim community to build bridges within a large and vibrant Jewish community. And so that type of work and those micro examples at the local level, I think really help feed the vision that both Natalia and Cheryl described for advocacy, for bridge building, et cetera. So it's a little bit of a national organizations casting the vision and then local communities helping build and drive towards it. Can I just add something to what George said real fast as a story because you're, you're right on George. Um, on our civil rights trip down south, we were in one very small southern community and worked with Habitat for Humanity. We wanted to rebuild a house. So we go into this neighborhood. Here in the front yard is a big sign, welcome sisterhood of Salam Shalom. A bus pulls up, 50 women get off, some with head covering, some without. People are lining the street. They have never seen Jews, they've never seen Muslims, and they've never seen Muslims and Jews together. We rebuild the house. Habitat for Humanity calls us the next week and said, we've been trying to get the Jewish community and the Muslim community to volunteer. It's what your religions believe in. No one has ever responded to us. Since you did this, we now have volunteers from the Muslim community and the Jewish communities in Birmingham, Alabama, signed up to rebuild homes moving forward. So you're 100% right, George, and the visibility that we are working on larger communities and changing the world is really important. Well, I'm very glad that you gave those additional examples because all I was hearing before was that the only common cause around which Jews and Muslims are organizing is hate. And that would be a pity because I think there are a lot more positive things around which we can make common cause. So thank you for those additional examples. Um, related to that, um, I'd like to ask another couple of questions. One, and you can probably respond to this very quickly. How has, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your work? We talked before about the conspiracy theories and so on that it spawned, but just a quick round of how it's impacted your work specifically. So I'm happy to start, um, you know, regarding the advocacy work, which is the bread and butter of the council. We've actually seen a lot of success in getting co-sponsors to the legislation that the council is advocating for. And I think it has something to do with that. You, you know, if you sign, get an elected official to agree to a 15, 20 minute Zoom conversation and we, we have their, um, Oh, you know, undivided attention. So we've seen a number of, uh, and this, I'll give a brief uh, overview of the legislation that we're advocating for. 
which is every year the FBI by law has to release a report on the hate crime statistics around the country. And while we, we have those numbers, you know, about uh, the Jews are the largest target of uh, religious based hate crimes and the, the numbers in New York City or LA, but there are a vast majority of uh, counties and states that don't report anything to the FBI because the information that they have to provide to the FBI is on a voluntary basis. So they're, you know, for this, the most recent report, there were 85 cities with a large population of 100,000 and more that did that either reported zero or did not report anything to the FBI. And what this legislation is doing is providing resources to uh, those cities and states that want it to do a better job in getting, um, in collecting the information, building relations with the communities so they're able to um, submit information to the FBI. And this legislation has bipartisan support in the House. And we've gotten more than, um, I want to say, at last count, 10 new co-sponsors to that legislation since the pandemic started. And it's a result of having those short um, advocacy meetings. So that's been a positive side. But the challenge is, how do you, and, and we are able to continue uh, building on the relationships that have already been established between the council members, because the, as I said, the council's been around for all, now this year, four years. But the challenge is how do you build um, new coalitions? You know, how do you build, bring in new members who don't have a previous relationship to be able to have um, new councils or new um, conversations about uh, issues of common concern between the Muslim and Jewish community. So that's a challenge that we're thinking about, you know, if, if you're not going to be able to have in-person meetings um, for the foreseeable future, and a lot of the things that we want to touch upon um, are helped or can only happen once you're in the room because you need to have that connection. How do you do that uh, virtually? So that's, that's something that we're thinking about. Okay, um, we only have a couple of minutes left before we open this up to the audience. So I'm just going to direct a couple of questions to each of you, if you would please just try to keep your response to 30 seconds. Um, George, why don't I give you this one? Um, how do you combat extremist positions in both communities? Um. Great question. Very easy too. Easy to respond to in 30 seconds. Thank you for that softball. Um, the, way, the way that you respond uh, to extremist positions on any end of the ideological spectrum and on any issue is with facts, with consistency, and with some degree of a level playing field. I mean, you hear the expression all the time, apples to apples. We've got to keep facts on issues um, at, at a level playing field. So the conspiracy theories and the I heard from someone or I read this on the internet somewhere, we have to, we have to diligently ask representatives or members of any community to kind of put those aside and stay focused on the facts on the issues and make sure that consistently we're helping drive communities to a place of common cause and common good and not at a place where they're being pulled apart. I'll take that. <laughs> well done. Cheryl, um, what's your observation? Are your constituencies growing or do you find that people are becoming more insular? 30 definitely, seconds. Yeah, definitely growing. Um, the numbers just talk about it going from a small organization to a movement. Um, at any one point in time, we've got 1,000 to 2,000 women planning to join the sisterhood and requesting to join. Um, because of the growth and the demand, we've now redefined membership to you don't have to be in a chapter. And COVID has allowed us to do this, to take everything we're doing virtual and offer the opportunities for more women to get together. Women on different islands in Hawaii now have chapters virtually. So definitely growing. So let me use that response as a segue for you to give another very quick response before I go to the others. You partly answered it already. How can people engage with your work? Um, several ways. Come to our website, S-O-S-S, -S, 
peace, P-E-A-C-E dot org. Contact us. You'll be on our list. You will be invited to everything we're doing, including tomorrow at 1 p.m. on Facebook Live with Senator Booker talking about what we could do as Jews and Muslims in response to hate. Um, we would love to have you involved in everything. Um, the other thing is there is a documentary coming out on the Sisterhood by an independent organization. Um, it talks about the power of love over hate and Muslims and Jews coming together to stop hate. I would welcome any of you to help us bring it to your communities. We could do virtual and give you a, a talk back panel, but please be involved and help us to educate the communities around us on why hate is from the minority and there are more people stepping up to say no to hate and we could help educate those how to do that. Natalia. Yes. So tell us how people can engage with MJAC. So one thing I'll direct everyone to the website, it's called muslimjewishadvocacy.org. Uh, there you can sign up to be part of our listserv. There's a take action section where we encourage everyone to contact their representative to help advance le legislation that I've mentioned. And another thing is if anyone has expertise on social media, you know, the other, we've talked about hate and the advocacy, you know, the second pillar of MJAC that we're now advancing, which is to highlight the contributions of Muslims and Jews in America. And we're going to be launching our social media presence through uh, these videos. So if anyone has expertise on or want to discuss more about how we can do that effectively, uh, feel free to reach out to us. We would love to, um, to get your, your thoughts on it because we only have one shot at at having that launch and we want to make sure that we're, we're right now learning and listening to um, everyone on, on the best ways to engage with people virtually. And George, how can people Very, engage with ADL? Yeah, a, a host of ways, ADL offices in 25 cities across the country, ADL.org. And the last plug I'll share is that you know, for, for, the, for the members and for the friends of the Jewish Funders Network, um, it's important to note that I just want to take a second to promote the work of my colleagues here, of Cheryl and Natalia and the tremendous work that Georgette has done. I mean, it's so important that as you think about um, funding and philanthropy in this space, it's not one organization or another, but it's about finding ways for us to collectively lift all of our work up together. And so I'm personally tremendously grateful for the work of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom. I've personally worked and been involved with AJC and worked with Georgette in a previous life. And so the work that they do is tremendous, but the work that we each do individually is just a piece. And so collectively, as you think about making investments in this space, it's not just about one.org or over another.org. It's about finding ways to advance this work collectively for the country and for a global community of people of consciousness who want to do the right thing. And we're all trying to find ways to get people on board and we need your help to do that. Well, that was a very good uh, summary statement. Thank you, George. Okay, I see And Andres. I just uh, was fascinating uh, for me to listen to this conversation. And I just wanted to commend you all for the amazing work you're you're doing and i guess that what i what i would love to to know specifically is you know the specific initiatives that uh funders and and specifically jewish philanthropists can do through an organization like jeff and um to to be to be part of the solution. So for those of you who were um, on this webinar and you don't know who Andres is, Andres is the president of the Jewish Funders Network. And before our panelists respond to your excellent question, um, I just, since we're all very busy commending each other, I want to commend JFN because I have seen JFN evolve from an organization that has been very focused on the Jewish community 
to one that has really opened up in terms of dealing with issues like Muslim Jewish relations, like what's going on in the Arab world, uh, and has certainly been hugely supportive in terms of the Syrian crisis. And um, I think that that's uh, just such an important thing to do. And I want to thank JFN for being so open to doing programs like these and bringing attention to these issues. So now, um, why don't you go ahead and respond to Andre's questions about what the philanthropic community can be focusing on in terms of initiatives. I'm sure. I mean, beyond, beyond the obvious, right? That the philanthropic community can give money, but is there, a, is, there, is there do's and don'ts for the philanthropic community in this field? Yeah, this is where I think the best practices questions question comes up. I'll offer one initial suggestion to just kick us off, which is, Every organization represented on this call and every philanthropic, you know, organization that's listening today benefits from concrete data and information. And it's so important that every year ADL continue to drive, you know, in-depth data and analysis on anti-Semitic incidents, on xenophobic incidents, on Islamophobia, etc. And that data is not just for us as an organization, but for everyone represented on this call and for your organizations to use that data, to use that analysis, to drive and inform the decisions that you make. And so one suggestion, broadly speaking, is to say, find organizations and find projects that are specifically focused on, on, on high level and quality data and analysis that's defensible and comes from a place that, that helps lift up this work overall. And those are the types of issues longer term that I think phil the philanthropic sector need to really focus on, on helping build up within the advocacy world is, um, is this concept of being a really data-driven uh, set of issues. And I would respond um, off of what George said. If we want to have a civil society and we want a world where our children and grandchildren could live without fear. We need um, organizations that are from the top down and the bottom up, providing the facts, educating people, um, giving people the skills, fighting at the top to stop hate and bringing people together at the bottom and you need that full circle to be really effective. Um, so often we hear, oh, Muslims and Jews getting together, whether it's to know each other, to break bread together, that's kumbaya. It is not kumbaya. Go back to that research. Over 95% of women involved in the sisterhood are more likely to speak out against hate now than prior to joining the sisterhood. On average, telling almost 25 others about the importance of interfaith engagement and speaking up against hate and Muslims and Jews coming together. Imagine what we could do if we all had the resources to reach every Muslim and Jew in the United States so that they could change the course of hate today. Yeah. And that's where the resources are needed to allow us to be able to do that. And I was just adding on, just, um, just very quickly to what George and Cheryl said, you know, a lot of times, at least the Muslim Jewish space is defined by extremism with, with that engulfs um, the space. And every time we send out an action alert or we, you know, AJC is that is always bombarded with, well, Muslims and Jews coming together and you're talking about fighting hate or white supremacy, but isn't religious extremism within your own communities, the actual problem. And that's, you know, it, it just emphasized something that George said was just looking at your current list of funders and seeing how, if they respond, you know, anyone that's countering extremism um, and, and terrorism, if they're doing it responsibly rather than just painting everyone with this broad brushstroke, because that's something that needs to be um, looked into. Um, and that's something that it falls on um, the, the Jewish Funders Network and other uh, philanthropy organizations. Thank you. And thank you, Andres, 
Um, although we're ending a couple of minutes early, I think that this has been a really interesting and constructive session and very important information conveyed to everybody who has participated in this webinar. So thank you to my panelists. Thank you to JFN. And uh, till the next time, stay well and healthy, everybody. Yes. Thank and you, let's, everyone. And let's keep the conversation going. I think this is, let's look at this as a first step to keep on building on this. Thanks, everybody. Let's Bye. Bye. Bye.